Okay, you ready, Roberto? Are you I'm ready? ready, brother. Okay. Hold on one second, guys. Welcome to the Health Detective. to the Health Detective Podcast with Roberto Parker. Join strength and conditioning expert Roberto Parker as he shares his over 35 years of experience in training athletes and helping people achieve their fitness goals. Now here's your moderator, Chris Whiting, with Coach Roberto. Hey, welcome everybody to the Health Detective Podcast. I know you've got to be as excited as me because it's been a minute since we've done this. So I hope your health has not gone completely downhill in the last couple of weeks, but we're here to pick you up. And as always is the man of the hour, Roberto Parker. How are you, Roberto? I'm doing great, baby. Oh, the gun show. <laughs> Somebody hasn't taken the last couple of weeks off. That's for sure. Chris, I never take off. Well, uh, that's why you're Roberto and that's why I'm me. Um, Hey, but I'm striving every day. Right. Well, and, I'm trying. And, uh, <laughs> um, oh, sorry. And, and so, Roberto, tell us, tell us what we're going to be talking about tonight. And this we is something. Talking, we are talking about insulin resistance. Now, <clears throat> insulin resistance is a pretty bad epidemic in this country right now. I'd say probably half of our population are either insulin resistant or pre-diabetic, which leads to insulin resistance. I should say insulin resistance leads to, to being type two diabetic. So it's the big reason why so many people are, are overweight and have problems with illnesses and diseases and all kinds of debilitative type of disorders. Well, and you know, when, when people hear insulin resistance, or at least me, I'm thinking diabetes, but it can you can be insulin resistant without being fully diabetic. Is that right? Well, type there's two types of diabetic. Okay, type one is where your pancreas doesn't make enough insulin. Typically, you are born with that. That's called juvenile diabetes. That's something you're more likely born with. Type two diabetes is more uh, attached to lifestyle. So that is the result. You usually get that when you get into your 30s and 40s. That is a result of a crappy lifestyle, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, so you can be born with insulin resistance or you can bring it on by your lifestyle. Well, now insulin resistance now, so you're making insulin, but your body's not hearing insulin. Type one di di diabetes, your body's not making enough insulin. Okay, gotcha. Type one, you're, you're not making enough of it. Type two, you're making it, but your body is not getting the message. Okay. And that type two, where your body isn't getting the message, that's where most of our population finds themselves having issues with insulin. A absolutely. A lot of the things that are going on today, you know, with the coronavirus and COVID, uh, chronic overweight, obesity, heart, heart disease, cancer. I mean, if you look at, if you really peel away the layers, most of it is related to insulin. And wow. I did a, uh, you know, I do a thing called the IST health tip of the week. And a few months ago, and I talked about the three most important things in, in terms of long-term health, insulin, muscle density, and the health of your gut. Insulin is huge because when insulin gets out of balance, there's a lot of things happening with your adrenals, with inflammation, 
with your body's not, not making enough hormones or not recognizing hormones, cancer cells become more prevalent. So there's a lot of problems when insulin gets out of balance. You can use insulin to your advantage or to your disadvantage. All of us, all of us makes all of us need to make insulin. We do that. Mm -hmm. But it's how insulin is received. For example, if someone comes knocking at your door in the middle of the night and you don't answer the door, but the person keeps knocking louder and louder and louder and louder and more aggressively in a very violent manner, but you still don't answer the door. That's what's happening with insulin as it, re as it relates to glucose, which is your blood sugar. So when blood sugar, blood sugar becomes chronic, if you're consuming too much refined carb, too much sugar, too many grains, your body becomes almost in a state of inflammation. And when it becomes chronic, insulin will no longer do its job. It, it's not hearing the message that glucose is trying to relate to it. And with that excess sugar in your body, it will become toxic and eventually it can become fatal. So is that then why people take insulin is because their body's not using it when they're type two or is it they're not, not creating it anymore? Well, you know, there, there are insulin type of drugs out there, which I, honestly, they don't do a damn thing. Uh, they just kind of address the symptoms is, is what they do. Mm -hmm. So, and really the best way to lessen insulin resistance is eat less sugar, eat less refined carbohydrates, start exercising because when you're exercising, the muscles will help to open up the door of insulin sensitivity. You want to be insulin sensitive, not insulin resistant. And that's why, that's why working out and exercise is so important because the more you exercise, particularly, particularly if it is more strength and conditioning type of exercise, your muscles will respond to insulin. Your, oh. muscles, your muscles and your liver are the two most important tissues relative to insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the more muscular you are, I'm not talking bodybuilder muscular, I'm talking just good lean muscle. And the more you maintain that, you are knocking on the door of increasing your insulin sensitivities is what that's exactly what you want. Gotcha. Now you used another I word that we've talked about a lot here, which was inflammation. Uh -huh. When it comes to insulin, does insulin resistance lead to inflammation or can inflammation lead to insulin resistance? Because I know we've talked about inflammation being a precursor to a lot of health issues. Um, insulin resistance can lead to inflammation and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Inflammation can lead to insulin resistance. And this is one you probably will appreciate, Chris. When your body becomes insulin resistant, you can become inflamed in certain areas of the body, Go which on. can lead to prostate issues, oh. which can lead to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is important for getting an erection. Oh, yeah. Well, now we're talking. Yes. Yeah. So, so now with insulation, you're blocking off those blood vessels. You're constricting those blood vessels. So now blood is not getting to the areas to keep the old pencil lead sharp. <laughs> wow. There's so much that leads into this. The, the S234. The, uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So is it is it, you know, you talked about it's especially important to do strength conditioning and, you know, weightlifting, those types of things. Will cardio help you at all when it comes to insulin resistance? Yes, but I'm a bigger believer in circuit training. Uh, believe it or not, you can do too much cardio. For example, people who, men, they have found in studies who do extreme amounts of distance running, marathon running, mm -hmm. and actually lower, have lowered their, lowered their testosterone levels. Yeah, so well. So having said that, I believe that you should do more strength work mm -hmm. in addition to circuit type training. I'm not opposed to some cardio work, but you better, you better coincide that with plenty of strength work 
It could be body weight training like pull-ups and push-ups and one-legged squats or abdominal crunches or sit-ups, but you better be straining and taxing those muscles a little bit around your legs, around your back, your shoulders, the bigger muscles of the body. Doing a lot of cardio is not going to do that. Now, unless you're going to be on something like a rowing machine mm -hmm. where you can vary the resistance because you can use that as a cardio or as a strength mechanism or a type of device. Gotcha. So, you know, there are, there are ways of doing it. Jumping rope. Jumping rope is an excellent way to build cardio and strength, uh, particularly in your legs. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get so much upper body, but your legs. Uh, but I like more circuit type training, the type of stuff I do and Jane do. Gotcha. You know, where we, you do a set of weights, maybe jump rope, do a set of weights, jog a lap around the track, do a set of weights, hit the bag for three or four minutes, a heavy punching bag. The, that type of work I like to do more. And you, you have to tax the muscles. And yeah. sometimes cardio doesn't tax the skeletal muscles. Cardio is great for the cardiac muscle, which is your heart and your lungs but it doesn't really tax the skeletal muscles. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Plus, I don't know. I mean, this is just my opinion, but I think it's more fun to do circuit type stuff than, yeah. you know, for me yeah. to just run and run and run. Well, some people might disagree because I know people who just love, love to run. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I want to talk about the three macronutrients here. Um, carbohydrates, protein, fats. Okay. This is important too, because, Carbohydrates can be used very, very easily by the body. It's a cheap way to energize the body. We've talked about this before. And when you're taking in excess amount of carbs, that will be stored as glycogen. It converts to glycogen. Now, glycogen is stored in the body. When glycogen is stored, it's either going to be, it's going to turn to body fat uh -huh. or used by the muscles of the body, your skeletal muscles. That, mm -hmm. is why, that is why it is important, in my opinion, to do more strength work and circuit work because the muscles are the biggest depository area for glycogen. So glycogen will mainly energize muscle. So you got to work it off by doing a lot of weightlifting, body weight training, those sort of things. Now, protein, number two. Protein can convert itself to glucose and glycogen if it is not used for muscle repair and muscle building. Now, most people think of protein as, okay, I'm going to take my protein and get my muscles big, right? Right. Okay, well, when the good Lord made us, he gave us a backup system because if you're carb depleted and you're taking in protein, protein can be also converted to glycogen to be used as energy for the body and for the brain but it's not used as as efficiently as carbohydrates it's harder to break down protein is mainly used should be mainly used to build up muscle and to repair muscle okay? well now are, are we talking ketosis when it turns into the glycogen or is that something different no no, no, no. number three not done yet oh number three macronutrient, saturated fats. Now, saturated fats will not convert to glycogen, mm -hmm. okay? So if you're on a high fat type of eating plan, low carbs, practically zero carbs, and moderate amount of protein, and you're working out and you're burning off that protein like you should, that's when you go into ketosis. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Insulin is a storage hormone. It will, it will, your body will use it as energy if it's done correctly. That leads to more what we call anabolism, being anabolic. It's putting on size. It's putting on, it's adding size to the tissues and organs of your body. Now that can be a bad thing too, because if you become too anabolic and you're not healthy, that can lead to cancer. Oh, okay, because that can lead to growth factors increasing the potentiality of cancer tumors. Now, ketones, which is a more, a harder way for the body to energize itself, 
that requires you almost going zero carbs, very, very, very low carbs, moderate to high amounts of protein and high amounts of saturated fats. That's when your body makes ketones. When mm -hmm. your body makes ketones, that is more catabolic, meaning your body is using fat for energy instead of glycogen. That's basically the difference of fats and carbohydrates. If you're gonna be on a ketone type of eating plan, fat is your main source of energy for your muscles and your brain. If you're eating mainly a balanced standard American type diet, which is higher amounts of carbs, or even moderate amounts of carbs, now your body's using glycogen primarily as a source of energy. Now, when that glycogen gets out of control and it becomes chronic and it starts storing itself as fat, and you keep taking more and more carbs like sugar and breads and cereals and alcohol, now the body becomes chronically induced by all of these things and insulin is not gonna do its job anymore. Insulin says, wow. I hear the message, but I'm not gonna respond. Wow. Follow me? I'm, I'm tracking, yeah. Okay, yeah. so there's a lot of metabolic cellular stuff that goes on with the body which is why I'm so big, I propose when I counsel people, you have to look at the body as a molecular cellular structure. That is how you design a program for yourself. Getting on some sort of cookie cutter, generic, whatever trendy popular diet there is, that crap doesn't work most of the time. You've got to get down to the cellular level, metabolic level of how the body functions and how you as an individual will respond to different cycles of eating, protein, fats, carbohydrates. Gotcha. How does someone know if they're, they're having insulin resistance going on? Are there going to be symptoms they'll experience or do they have to get lab tested? Yeah, there's symptoms. I mean, you can pretty much tell by looking at somebody and typically the best way to do it, their gut. If you're developing a big amount the large amount of fat around your belly button, that's called visceral fat, mm -hmm. you're probably insulin resistant or not gonna grow up type two diabetes. Oh, wow, okay. okay if, you're, if you're losing muscle density and you're putting on a lot of visceral fat around the midsection that you cannot get rid of, that's pretty much an indicator of me. It's more subjective mm -hmm. that you're more likely insulin resistant. I can look at also lab work like your A1C, your fasting glucose. I can look at insulin. Uh, we can look at leptin with those, those sort of things. You know, there's more objective ways of measuring and more quantitative ways to do it, but a more subjective way. Well, here's a good, here's a, a really good way. It's more subjective. You take your, you take the diameter of your waist and divide it by your height. So your Boy. waistline size divided by the number of inches you are in height. And uh -huh. that number, that number should be lower than 50. Oh, wow. I got to do okay. some cipher in here. Okay. So if, if it's higher than 50, chances are you're, you're probably IR insulin resistance or knocking on the door of it or possibly even type two diabetic. Wow. Okay. 0.478. Woo. Okay. That's not bad. I'm under just barely, just yeah, barely. Yeah, just barely. Okay. Now some of the, some of the other indicators, how can I, or let me talk about this. How can I reduce insulin resistance? Well, we all know this, cut back sugar, cut back refined carbohydrates, cut down the frequency of how many meals a day you're eating. Now, uh, you know, years ago, uh, the thing was, well, we got to graze and not gouge. You got to eat several meals a day. Remember that? that I day? remember that. Yeah. Yes. Every, okay. every few hours you need to be eating. Well, I would say you need to scratch that. So I'm a big proponent of uh, OMAD one meal a day. Now we're going to, we're going to talk about that a couple weeks ago, but we didn't have a podcast. One meal a day, which is not easy to do initially, uh, especially yeah. if you're more of a sugar burner. Uh, quality sleep, customized eating program, customized exercise program for your body type and for your motivational type. Some people are not very motivated. Yeah. Okay? Some people need to gradually work their way into it. Yeah. Uh, 
also look at, once again, your, your weight divided by your height ratio. And those are ways you can kind of look at what's going on and, and reduce the probability of you having insulin resistance. I can also look at your adrenal glands where you spit in a cup four times a day. We could look at what your uh, cortisol levels are doing because if you're under chronic stress, that can lead to insulin resistance, which, and by the way, that can also lead to excess fat gain when, you're, when your adrenal glands are always high, 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 and then they, they never relax. Typically, that's going to lead to uh, excess fat gain. I had read that, that cor too much cortisol can lead to belly fat. Yes, yes, because cortisol's, cortisol's role and job is also to help elevate blood sugar in times of stress. Mm -hmm. And so if you're chronically stressed, and your blood sugar is chronically high, once again, insulin will not respond because it becomes fatigued. Like again, someone's knocking at your door, but you're not answering. Yeah. Okay. And that's basically what happens when cortisol becomes high, your adrenal glands gets out of control because of physical stress, chemical stress, which is usually nutrition or some sort of emotional stress. Adrenal glands will go overboard and produce too much cortisol. Some people call it norepinephrine, so uh, adrenaline too. So when that happens, that can lead to insulin resistance, which can lead to excess fat gain, which can lead to uh, chronic inflammation. Typically people who are overweight have more inflammation, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, if you were to look at their body. And a way to measure inflammation, by the way, is a blood marker called C-reactive protein. Okay? Hmm, not there's, heard of this. There's another blood marker out there called interleukin-6, which is also used, by the way, these two are also used to possibly look at the potentiality of the COVID-19, because typically, once again, it all goes back to inflammation. People with high amounts of inflammation or propensity to have inflammation, usually our people are going to be more susceptible to being sick and getting diseases and getting long-term illnesses. You know, it's it's interesting too. You mentioned um, the the stress, and I know it's an epidemic, especially here in the states. Not just with COVID, but just the way we live. We work long hours, and everything's an emergency. But the working out, not only the, I guess, the physical part of working out can help with the physical processes that lead to insulin resistance. But I say it's a twofer because working out also helps with stress a lot too yep. and can can take your stress levels down. So um, you can work out too much now. I mean, now most Americans are not guilty of that, but you can train too much. I would say that most probably most high powered athletes, they're overtrained. Now, mm -hmm. having said that, most of them are pretty young. So you're gonna go through a phase in your life where yeah, you're gonna overtrain too much, but see their bodies are so young they can recover quickly. Yeah. Okay. I don't recommend that for somebody after age 40 or 45 or 50. Mm -hmm. Because your body's not gonna respond the same way as it did when you're in your 20s and maybe even into your early 30s. Preach. You know, now Michael uh, Phelps, you know, the Olympic swimmer years ago, trust me, that guy was overtraining. Yeah. I mean, because, well, well, you know, swimmers, swimmers are in the pool probably four or five hours a day. Yeah. And that's just in the pool. Dry land training, they're probably doing another two hours a day. I was watching the Olympics that are happening right now, and I was was marveling a little bit at all of these very young athletes that are wrapped up. They've got K tape everywhere. Um, just so many injuries. And my thought was they, they train all the time. I, yeah. I, you know, you might call it overtraining. And of course they do. My, my dad mode kicked in and I'm like, wait a minute, how much pain are they going to be in later on in their lives when all this stuff and the overtraining and the injuries catch up to them? That's part of the game, brother. Some of them are going to be in a lot of pain. I mean, look at look at some of the NFL uh, athletes, the NBA NBA athletes. You know, they're playing 180 games in the NBA. No, 180 in baseball. They're playing about 90 in the NBA. They're playing. Yeah. Well, they're going to move it to 17 in the NFL. 
I mean, your body takes a beating. Yes. Okay. Now yeah. you're making a boatload of money, <laughs> you know, but your body takes a beating. And honestly speaking, your body's really not meant to do that over a long period of time. Our bodies are meant to be exerted in small bouts. Mm -hmm. We're meant to intensify and stress our bodies in small incremental bouts. Working out four hours a day, five hours a day, six hours a day, that is not going to go a chronic stress. Now, once again, those people are young and their bodies will recover nicely in most cases. I don't recommend that for somebody after age 35 or 40. Yeah. Yep. No, I totally makes sense. Um, and if, if somebody's sitting at home and they're like, oh man, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting fat around my, my belly, my, my belly button's getting fat. Um, do you, do you recommend they get right into like body weight training? Do you recommend that somebody that hasn't been real active gets active first before they work out? I, yeah, you have to gradually work your way into it. I mean, it depends on the person's background. I mean, if I'm training somebody who was a, you know, an athletic person and, and they've been removed from her for only a few years, we can kind of jump into it a little faster. But mm -hmm. if somebody has never been an athletic person, never worked out, never broke on a sweat in their life, we got to start out really, really, really slow. Or so, yeah, I mean, I recommend walking, of course. That's one of the most, the best things you can do to lower cortisol too, by the way. Okay. And, and holding weights in your hand as you're walking, small hand weights, maybe wearing some ankle weights or maybe a light weight vest as you're walking. That probably at step two. Step three, now let's get into some more isolated types of exercises in the gym. Maybe we can do some body weight squats, body weight lunges. Uh, some assisted pull-ups, assisted push-ups, those sort of things. You have to gradually work your way into it. Yeah, yeah, totally and, makes sense. So yeah, because you have to train those skeletal muscles. That's the key here. The operative word, skeletal muscles. It's not enough just to do cardio. In fact, getting back to your cardio question, if you're doing excessive amounts of cardio, you tend to metabolize muscle. You can, oh. you lose some muscle, you lose some body fat too now, but you will also lose muscle and muscle, believe it or not, the older you get is very important because that's, that is what's going to keep you alive because muscles connect to joints, connect to vertebrae in your body. And those joints have nerves that run from the joint to different organs and tissues of the body. So it is incumbent on your part now, speaking to people out there, to get those muscles around the vertebrae and the joints strong as possible, because that communicates with brain, heart, lungs, pancreas, ovaries, prostate, you name it, it does it. And when those organs become stronger, you're going to reduce the aging process, you're going to feel better, you're going to have more energy. Case closed. Totally makes sense. You know, uh, my wife, Jane, you know her, uh, was telling me about an article she read yesterday, and it was about old men um, getting the the flat old man ass uh -huh. and walking like an old man. And, and the article, and maybe this isn't true, you can weigh in, said that if you continue to work your glutes, if you squat and lunge and work work your glute muscles as you get older, you won't walk like an old man because you won't get that flat old man ass. Um, well, your glutes, your glutes are part of your uh, posterior chain. And so the reason you see a lot of old people tilting over as they walk is because their posterior chain is weak. And you, when you get your butt stronger, you get your lumbar spine stronger, you get your thoracic spine stronger, you're gonna tend to stand taller. And also yes. you're, gonna be, you're gonna be a lot less susceptible to tripping and falling because usually tripping and falling involves weaker muscles because people can't hold their own body weight up. Yeah. And here's the thing about They're tripping and falling. Right. It's funny when people are young, but you get old and tripping and falling is not so funny anymore. No, it's not. Yeah. Well, well, also because as you get older, your bones become more fragile. Uh, there's a thing called osteopenia or, you know, it, once again, if you're not, if you're not, training your body like you should and exercising and eating the right type of foods, 
your bones can become more porous. Mm -hmm. That's called osteopenia, also osteoporosis. And so when you fall, you're going to be more susceptible to breaking bones. Yeah, yeah. And that's not good. And there, I just want to, I know we're pushed for time here. I want to yeah. close with this. Genetics is the seed. Lifestyle is the soil. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah, because there are a lot of people that will say, well, I just, my family hasn't been athletic. I wasn't born with athletic abilities. So why try? But okay, uh, here's, here, here's my answer to that. All of us, we've had this conversation before. All of us are athletes. Mm -hmm. All of us evolved from people who lived in the wild. Yeah. And at that time, we, that was survival of the fittest. The strongest, baddest, most agile people survived in the wild. And we are byproducts of those people. Now, what has made us lazy asses mm -hmm. is the way we live our lives, our culture. Because yeah. I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit. We live too comfortable of a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And the more comfortable you are, you don't want to sweat. You don't want to hurt. You want to eat comfort foods. You just want to be comfortable. Yeah. And that, that leads to complacency. That leads to poor health, in my opinion. Yeah. Because you have to challenge yourself physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally to get stronger in life. Mm -hmm. And that's where we all evolve. Now, some people are, I will say this, some people like LeBron James has a gift Sure. That most of us don't have. He has a gift. Mm -hmm. Okay. But all of us can be athletic or active in some sort of way. If you're a five foot five, you're not going to be an NBA basketball player. Yeah. But you could be a hell of a swimmer. You could be a power walker. You could be a good weightlifter. You could be a wrestler. You could, uh, I don't know, climb fences, climb ropes real well. Yeah. Something. You got to find something physically challenging in your life that you're kind of excited about. Yeah. Hey, and if you're Spud Webb or Muggsy Bogues, you can right. end up in the NBA that way. There but I get it. Most of us are not. Um, yeah, that gifted at that size. But but I love I love that that hey, everybody can be active. Everybody's an athlete. And I'd never thought about that before. But yeah, if you look at only, you know, the strongest would survive in the past. That means all of us that are here are descendants of those that were strong enough to survive. Absolutely. And that's how you have to look at it. It's unfortunate that in industrialized societies, we have a propensity of high insulin. Mm -hmm. Because when your insulin is very, very high, most of the time, you're shortening your life. I'll give you an example. There's a lady I read about years ago. Her name was Jean Calumet. Look her up. Jean Calumet, C-A-L-U-M-E-T. She was from oh. France. She smoked cigarettes every day. This lady lived to be 122 years of age. Oh, my gosh. But she had very low insulin. Why? Wow. Because even though she smoked, which most Europeans do, by the way, uh, she rode her bicycle every day. She walked about five, six, seven miles a day. Mm -hmm. She didn't eat a lot of meals because, you know, in Euro a lot of European countries, they don't eat big meals. They don't supersize. Her meals were very limited and her insulin was very, very low. She lived to be 122 years of age and she would ride her bike almost every day up until about age 100, 105, something like that. Holy cow. Yeah, and she was amazing. She was amazing. Wow, that that so, is amazing. So I'm just I'm just saying it, it is possible. So when people tell me it's not possible, I say BS. It is possible. You just have to change some things in your lifestyle. Hey, Which, is that easy to do? No, it's not. <laughs> no, the concept is simple, but yes. actually following through is not easy. Yeah, and and that all comes back once again. And I'll finish up with this. The okay. three most important things in your life that you have to focus on is the health of your stomach. Mm -hmm. Because as we age, we start to lose stomach acid, keeping your stomach healthy. Insulin, 
keeping insulin stable and low as possible, not zero, but just low. Yeah. And the third is maintaining a good muscularly lean body. Okay. That's wow. it. If you do those three, you'll live a long, prosperous, healthy life. And maybe you'll be riding your bike at 105 years old. Who knows? Or you might be like Picasso, who fathered kids and in his 90s. Oh, God. No, no more kids. I love them to death. <laughs> I'm done. Next thing will be grandkids. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, planting a seed there, Chris. So there you go, buddy. Hey. <laughs> so uh, before we go too far down that rabbit hole, uh, you want to tell folks how they can, can get in touch with you if they want to work with you? My number is 816-405-7703. Email us rwpsports at yahoo.com. I'm also on Instagram. Just type in Roberto Parker at Instagram. I'm on there too. I don't get on there very often. I'm on LinkedIn. So there's different ways of contacting me. If you need any help, I'll, I do menu planning now. I'll sit down and I'll plan out a five, six, seven day menu with you. I do metabolic typing assessment. I do a lifestyle assessment and I'll do a customized program for you. I mean, seriously, folks, you know, it's it's your one stop shop. Just do it. So, Roberto, thank you. Enlightening and inspiring as always. And uh, I will see you in the morning, but I guess everybody else will see you at your next uh, health tip of the day or the next time we get together here in a couple of weeks for Health Detective. All right. Hey, we'll see you, Pastor Chris. Ah! OK, <laughs> now I'm now I'm going to go dark. All right, see ya. Bye. Into the Health Detective Podcast with Roberto Parker. You can contact Roberto at 816-405-7703 or by email at rwpsports at yahoo.com with any comment or question you may have. Join us next time for the Health Detective Podcast with Roberto Parker. The Health Detective Podcast with Roberto Parker has been a KCTK production produced by Roberto Parker, Chris Whiting, and Paul Lavota. All rights reserved. For more information and content, email us at kctkradio at gmail.com. Okay. Oh. Hey. Oh.